Thanks for coming. Uh, I'm Mark Miller with DGRI. And uh, these are guidelines, so not standards. They are used essentially to uh, help us as an entity and our citizen advisors go through the process of funding and investing in projects. So keeping that in mind as we go through these, they are guidelines. So these are not code, these are not policies, these are not mandates. Uh, so uh, our consultants on this project were Naderveld and Williamson Works. Uh, and interestingly enough, I was at Naderveld when this project started and by the time it was ended, I was at DGRI, so I became sort of the client during the process of this project, and um, so that's sort of a unique experience and a little tidbit of information. Uh, as all of these projects go, we had a robust community engagement process. I'm not going to go through all of these things. I think the, the biggest and most important one was that we actually had a, a process with the Innovative, Innovation Central High School where we had students go out and uh, analyze streets in our downtown, talk to us about what wasn't inviting about them. And really it was about a three week immersion with them where we went in and had them read certain text and uh, talk to them about this stuff and, and it was part of their curriculum. So it was really a, a unique way I think to have these conversations. And one of the things that came out of that which was for me at least a little bit interesting was that a lot of reasons why these these students weren't going downtown was they didn't have a place to plug in their phones or their technology so uh, that's something that we think about now in terms of like providing just electrical outlets for people who uh, do want to charge their phones uh, interesting I think in some ways uh, so the, the the street space guidelines were really created to help us as I said guide our investment and, and that's for a variety of different things that I'll get into later. Uh, and, and as it evolved, it became something that we wanted to put people first. And this is a theme that's going to be out throughout this presentation, but you'll hear it in terms of pedestrian-centric, pedestrian design, people first. Uh, all of those kind of things are all still going to the same purpose of like thinking about how we're designing these public spaces for people first. Uh, and it's about implementing our, our GR Forward Master Plan, some of the vital streets guidelines that are within the city of Grand Rapids, and then uh, really to build these well-balanced and beautiful street spaces. So it's about keep creating safe, accessible, connected, sustainable, interesting, and memorable places. And not something that you just drive through, but something that you're in. It's a place versus a throughway. Uh, and as we went through this, then it became obvious to us that there's not just there's just not enough space. And we always hear that there's not enough space for pipes, there's not enough space for cars, there's not enough space for buses. And so, how do we begin to prioritize our street space in a meaningful way to get to that idea of people first and still be able to think about those other things? So I put this in here. Uh, you, many of you are probably familiar with this. Uh, it's a it's a nice little diagram. And uh, at this point in time, it's kind of BS. So, um, and, and it's, it's unfortunate because it tells us what the priority is, right? Those two people are the first thing, and then it goes down. And you can have an argument about whether the bike is next or the transit. It really doesn't matter. And then the car is way down there. So uh, this is a great diagram, but we aren't really implementing it, and we're not doing it during the sausage making of building these places. So when you get down to the nitty gritty and have to make decisions about building these spaces, this thing sort of gets lost, and we start asking questions about how we're going to get people out of downtown, or is there enough turning radius for a car, or a, or a bus, or, a, or a, a semi truck. And we lose the fact that there's actually people using our streets. And so that again goes back to this idea of people first. And how can we integrate this into the discussion at the very forefront of the design so that we can start to have these conversations? And the important thing about this is that these are not bubbles. You know, they're not these cute little diagrams, but they're actually real people. And they're people who are actually using our streets in different ways. So these are all folks who have different challenges using our streets and how are we thinking about building those places our street spaces for those folks whether it's a child crossing the street whether it's somebody who's visually impaired or someone in a wheelchair and oftentimes these things are not thought about as we uh, go through this process the other thing to keep in mind is that little car over there is a 2,000 pound thing that's usually going about 40 miles an hour so it has a huge effect on all of these people 
who are using this street. And, and thinking about that car and its movements and how fast it's going and how big it is is very important in prioritizing these spaces. So the street space guidelines are about, obviously, also who. And so who, do, who uses these? So the engineering department will use them at the city of Grand Rapids. Private property owners will use them. Design professionals, hopefully, the Rapid. Our citizen alliances, some of whom are in the room today. Uh, downtown residents, and obviously all the people who use the street. So that's what these are intended, the intended audience is. And again, this is about informing all of those users as we, the DDA, the Monroe North TIFA, and even the DID oftentimes make decisions about investments in our streets and our street spaces. It's also important when we talk about street spaces to understand that it's actually, those are probably the biggest public spaces in our city. They compromise about 25, or compose about 25% of our space. That's more than our park infrastructure. That's more than any of our other infrastructure. So the streets are actually really important public spaces. And it's also important to know that they are public. They're for everyone, not just for cars and trucks. Uh, so the framework for the design of this stuff is all about, the, again, people first, and making the spaces inviting, and making them enduring. So. This is, this is part of a process that we went through, and a lot of this stuff came up to the top. We want to be able to optimize the people space, create these outdoor rooms. So this 25% of our public space is actually an outdoor room, not like a throughway. Uh, we're building for safety and accessibility. We're creating or cultivating grand street trees. We need to have more street trees in our downtown streets spaces. Uh, we need to invite people to linger, invite them to continue the journey and then doing that with providing some visual interest and creating that equitable access. And then obviously the enduring places part of this is really about building something that lasts and that's durable and that's maintainable. And it's interesting oftentimes that we get into these discussions about who actually owns some of this stuff that's in the street and who maintains it, and that's the important thing. So uh, has, a f has a, our DID, which is our downtown uh, improvement district, maintains a lot of this infrastructure, especially the the plants and the tr and the planters that are in this infrastructure. Uh, so those are ongoing conversations that we're having with the city of Grand Rapids. But right now, a lot of this stuff is just who maintains it, who maintains the brick sidewalk. We don't oftentimes even know that. Uh, so as I talked about the street space, this is really what it amounts to. So there's a bunch of different zones that we've created. Uh, the, the light blue is what we're referring to as the flex zone. It's the stuff in the street. It's where the cars park. It might be a turn lane, and I'll get into that a little bit more. Uh, this, the, this, these other three, the dark blue, the yellow, and the, the orange, are what we call the pedestrian zones, and there's three different ones. There's a furnishing zone, an amenity zone, and a through zone. The through zone's important because that's where the pedestrians sort of walk. We want to keep that clear. Uh, and we sometimes are, are challenged to even do that uh, with street furniture in particular. Um, the, the dark blue is uh, where we put all the stuff, hopefully, the trees, the benches, the planters, uh, keeping it out of that pedestrian zone. And then that orange zone oftentimes, if it exists at all, is where we can amenitize with like signs or even some temporary seating aspects. But our, some of our sidewalks are so small that we don't have the benefit of using that. So, so that's sort of one of those spaces that's uh, uh, always in, these are always contested spaces. So, it, because there's a lot of stuff to put in them. Uh, so where does all this stuff go and why? So, so this, is, this is really about each one of those chapters that deal with each one of these zones. Chapter two really deals with all all of this stuff right here. And then uh, chapter three is just the frontage zone, which is the building wall of that outdoor room. So architects would be interested in that, and a private sector developer would be interested in that. Uh, not all of these are relative to each project, so you have to sort of choose the chapter that fits your project. It's not going to be likely that you're using all three as you go through a project. So for instance, the engineering department in the city of Grand Rapids, when they rebuild a street, will likely just use chapter one and chapter two. A private developer who's doing a major project might use all three, but in most cases, they're only going to be using chapter two and chapter three, depending on if they're affecting that sidewalk space and that curb space. 
So that's sort of what this slide is all about. I won't go any further into that at this point. So we revisit this thing again, and uh, you know, again, it's it's one of those things where we've established the the cool graphic and the 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 desire to get to this point, but how are we actually doing it? And so instead of just saying that okay, that's a problem, what are some of the solutions to that? That's where we get into this rebalancing chapter. So because we have contested space, because we have to begin to think about prioritizing the pedestrian, hopefully, uh, this is a solution. This is one of our rebalancing activities that we show in our guidelines. And this is sort of the, the highest standard. This is where we hope to achieve success someday. We aren't gonna do this with all of our streets and we aren't probably gonna do it all at once. It has to be done incrementally. But this is a street that's very close by. It's in Chicago on the north side, north of Wrigley Field, uh, called Argyle Street. And it was reconstructed as a curbless street. So from building face to building face is all one level. There's plantings, there's uh, some paving markings, but it's actually a shared street. So cars go down it uh, slow, under 20 miles per hour. Uh, it, it deflects a little bit, so that helps to slow them down. It also, when you get to these side streets, here and here and down here, uh, the street actually comes up. So you're inviting the car into the realm of the pedestrian. So you're making these design decisions to let the people know who's driving the car that you know there's something else happening here and hopefully they slow up. There's enough other stuff, enough friction on the edges here that begin to give you cues from a design standpoint that tell you that this is a slow street. So it's a mixed street, there's all kinds of stuff happening. And, and one of the interesting things about streets like this is that there's that picture up in the top with the two bikers on it. You can bike on this street, you don't have to go through any kind of building bike infrastructure. The bike infrastructure is the street. Cars are going slow enough that you feel comfortable to ride the, 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 the bike. You don't need to go through the efforts of like building all of this stuff. So I think the point of that is, in one way, is that um, you know you, you prioritize the pedestrian. This is prioritizing the pedestrian. A lot of this other stuff takes care of itself. So we have to start thinking about designing for the pedestrian, building for the pedestrian, and, and these other modes, especially those other two modes, transit and bikes, really, I think, will move on and take care of themselves as we design that. So this is sort of some sample pages of the document, and it shows you specifically where that flex zone is. Uh, and it's really at the curb. And so there are, there are various conditions where this exists or doesn't exist. We've highlighted a few streets in our city, and the orange in those places begin to tell us where those zones are. So like Bridge Street, we can show you where the pedestrian, where the bikes are, where the cars are, and where the buses are. You can begin to see how our streets are breaking in terms of where these uses are. And, and oftentimes we've, we've compartmentalized them or channelized them and we still do all of this. We, we've decided to channelize uses just like we, we, we make distinctions with uses in our land use plans. And, and in doing that channelization, we've sometimes made our streets more dangerous for the people using them. So this is sort of an analysis of what's going on now and how we can begin to think about changing that. There are four conditions where we can begin to think about changing that, that or changing, rebalancing that street. One of them is when we have a four lane cross section and just taking some of those lanes back for other things, people, bikes, car, uh, buses, whatever it might be. Uh, the second one is when we have like these turn lanes, especially right and center left turn lanes. Uh, can we begin to take some of those away and rebalance them for other things? So I'll give an example of this on uh, Division Avenue uh, we will be reconstructing that next year south of Cherry to Wealthy. We're getting rid of most of the turn lane uh, that's in the center for left-hand turns, and that's going to become a boulevard. So that's going to effectively narrow some of the traffic or some of the lanes, which will slow down traffic. In addition to that, we're, we're, we're narrowing the actual travel lanes by about two feet for each one and giving that back to the, the sidewalk. Again, narrowing it, uh, making the cross section easier to cross and slowing down traffic. So that's sort of an example of that in application. Uh, when travel lanes are too wide, so that's another one. Oftentimes our travel lanes are 12 foot wide. We can narrow them down to sometimes 10 feet. Actually, if we could get to nine in some cases, that'd be great. 
Uh, and then when we have on-street parking, sometimes what do we do with that on-street parking? Should we be thinking about using that for a bike lane? Should we be thinking about making the sidewalks wider? These are all decisions where this can come into play, especially when our asphalt, our curbed curb dimension is, is too wide and making traffic uh, too fast. So this has got a lot of words and a lot of stuff on it, but what it really begins to tell us is two things. There are 11 different techniques that we've established to rebalance. I won't go into all of them, but one of them is that shared street philosophy, which is the sort of holy grail gold standard. Uh, there are other ones where we can do bulb outs, where we can um, uh, add parking, where we can take parking away and, and add bike lanes, protected bike lanes preferably. We can do transit bulbs so the bus doesn't have to pull off. It can stay in traffic, which helps its operational times. Uh, and even considering where parklets might go or where curb seating might go and where that starts to push out into some of those, those extraneous pieces where the car lives today. Uh, and then the other thing is about these questions that we ask. So oftentimes what you end up with is, you know, where will the cars go? How are we going to get people out of downtown? So these things happen during the sausage making of those, of those street designs. And we can ask those questions. It's okay to ask those questions. But it's all, we also have to begin to think about these other things. Like, you know, uh, have we, instead of talking about a traffic impact study, should we be talking about a pedestrian and bike impact study? Should that be one of the things that we start studying when we rebuild these streets? Uh, what about pavement patterns and materials that delineate space versus how we're preventing vehicles from jumping the curb, which is often a question. You know, like we, we actually build our street lights to break away in case a car hits them. Uh, you can see it in the bolt pattern at the sidewalk. And, and so we, we are conscious about this in a way that's sort of indifferent to the pedestrian. And getting past this conscious indifference for the pedestrian helps all these other modes and helps our city become a, a more robust and vibrant place. We have to invite people to come here and to hang out, or they're just not going to do it. And then we go through six different prototypes in the, in the guidelines. This is one of them. This is a simple one. This is the bus bulb that I spoke of earlier. So if you just take away some parking uh, and have that curb come out to where the bus is, it gives you more waiting space. It gives you a more dignified waiting space because we can put amenities in it like shade trees and, and benches and shelters so you're not standing in the rain waiting for the bus or the transit. And um, that's a way to sort of help everybody who's using that. It also narrows the cross section of the street so I can cross quicker and it's more safely. The other, another one is the one I shared earlier where we begin to take that street and turn it into a shared, more of a shared street uh, where cars and bikes and people can coexist in a more safe and dignified way. So then I'm going to turn this over to Stephanie to go into chapter two, which is our pedestrian zone. Hello. Um, so my name's Stephanie. Uh, Mark and I are sort of tackling this together chapter by chapter. So this is the second chapter in our street space guidelines. Uh, traditionally, streetscape guidelines are, you know, in every other city and usually just address what I'm going to go through here. But I think if you were to take anything away from uh, this presentation today, it's sort of what Mark was talking about, about the rebalancing, which I think um, is sort of unique to a document like this because we don't really get to address that that much. So the pedestrian zone overview, like Mark said, is uh, from curb to the face of the building, which is everything where the pedestrian will be walking mostly. Uh, again, the amenity zone, the through zone, which we try and keep at least six to eight feet wide, and then the shy zone. Um, for those who are developers or architects, I think this might be the most, one of the most important graphics that we have. Uh, we recognize that the downtown, it doesn't have one identity, it has multiple, especially if you're walking around, and so even down to the brick pattern. So if you look around downtown, there's about a two feet uh, brick on the very edge of uh, the curb. Um, and this allows for identity and also during uh, parked parallel parked cars that you're able to open your door just a little bit further. Um, so we split it up into different types, uh, street type 
one through five. Um, and so one is really addressing the downtown core um, with the medical mile in between, and that would be like brick, uh, the soldier pattern that is right here. Um, street space three, four, and five, which is mostly the heart side district, some stuff on the west side in the Monroe North neighborhood. Those would be more of the, uh, the uh, Spanish bond, which is what we call call these patterns right here. And so within each of those street types, we break it down even further about what we would recommend. Again, these are guidelines and recommendations that we want to try and keep our downtown more cohesive and have an identity of some sort. So within each of these, which I won't go through all of them, this is just an example of what uh, this street type one would look like. We would um, recommend using this type of bench, which we call out the material, the finish, the standard color. Uh, we go into a standard bike rack. Um, the litter and trash receptacle, we're trying to do more recycling in our downtown, so being able to be more cohesive about what that looks like and what all of our trash can looks like, and then even down to the landscaping containers. Uh, so we go into a lot of what the pedestrian zone is, which we're not going to call it out all of these, but it's more of like an a la carte of uh, different elements. So bike racks, trees, uh, planter boxes, and so cafe seating, um, I think is a really important topic, especially this, this time of year. Um, we're only allowed to have those out during a certain season. So uh, outlining exactly what that looks like and making sure that we're adhering to the city's ordinance as well. So again, if you look at this graphic here, you'll see uh, that two foot Spanish bond, which is where we would usually see the brick pattern that I was describing before. Um, several feet, depending on the width from the curb to the front of the building of where the sidewalk seating would like to see. And then that through zone, which is that yellow zone that we keep pointing out for where the pedestrians have that clear right away. Uh, we go into landscape plantings. A lot of what our DID, our downtown improvement district does, is we uh, maintain a lot of our plantings in downtown, so making sure that they're native and drought resistant. Um, most of all the new street construction, we're trying to encourage irrigation as well so that it's being taken care of and that we have bright, vibrant, beautiful downtown. Uh, I think I've already talked a little bit about the paving, but you can see this um, This is like the soldier course um, that you would see in like street type one, for example, and how you would um, identify that and even go around tree grates or a tree, uh, the porous that we have in the trees as well. Uh, public seating, I think, is maybe one of the most important things if we're talking about people first environments. Um, you know, we need things where we can lean against, things where we can sit. Uh, movable furniture, I think, is really important in this. Uh, Mark and I talk about if we were uh, taking a nap on Monroe Center dressed like the way are, we are, I don't think anyone would have a problem. But then you see other people where there's this uh, other people with a lot of stuff or dressed a little differently and that people feel uncomfortable or unsafe. And so um, trying to understand the, the, that we're trying to encourage more lingering and that there's a fine line between lingering and loitering. And so trying to encourage seating for all types of people and um, understanding what that looks like and, uh, and that could be block by block. Uh, we talk quite significantly about street trees in this document, and we've had a lot of conversations with the city about this. Um, I think in downtown, we strive to have at least a 10% street uh, canopy of trees. And so I think right now we're at about four or 5%. Um, so we have a lot to do, but uh, we've learned that urban street trees only have about seven years lifespan with the small ones that we have. So what does that look like if we want bigger tree canopies? And a solution was doing uh, big continuous planting trenches underneath the ground so that a lot of those roots can grow outward and live a little bit longer. And so that understands more soil volume um, in that sense. Okay, so this, this is the last chapter in the, the document, and it's, it's that wall. So it's the wall of the outdoor room, and it represents what the building is. So this would be used primarily by private sector developers who are you know, either building a new building or rehabilitating a building downtown. And again, keeping in mind that these are guidelines, and so when we 
are evaluating a project for our either our enhancement grant or our development support as an entity, uh, we, we need to have a better mechanism to evaluate it so that we can determine what the investment protocol is. And so this is a, this is a step for, toward getting us to this point where we are giving you some guidelines and allowing for that to, uh, to uh, inform our decision-making process for that funding. So the important thing here on this page is that I think overall what we're trying to achieve is a more active ground floor frontage. And that's what those diagrams on the right-hand side show you. Those are actually ripped off from uh, Jan Gale, uh, a Danish uh, urbanist who has written a lot about this kind of stuff. And so what we're trying to achieve is the A, B, or C level and not really the D and E level and certainly not the E level. So. Uh, we don't really want blank walls. And so we have to be very careful about how we uh, think about those those walls of that street. And so the more stuff you can have going on there, the more friction that's happening there, the more entourage that's going on uh, allows us to envision or beckon us to continue our journey. So um, thinking about it in those terms, we have to begin to think about like what the, what the uh, guidelines should be for these things. Uh, we, we also talk a lot about human scale. So uh, this page begins to tell us why that's important and, and what it actually means. Uh, so it's talking about the different uh, view sheds that you have as a human being up and down. So you can see on the first diagram that what you're really seeing is that ground floor, maybe the second floor, sometimes the third floor, and then the stuff above it, I mean, it's not really affecting the pedestrian experience necessarily. So we're really focused on that first two, three stories, but mo but primarily on that ground floor. If you can get the ground floor right, it's very important. Uh, and then how you experience the horizontal distance. So when it's close to you versus when it's further away from you, and all of those are important, but they're for different reasons. So there's part of it is about creating that safe space and that, that place where you want to hang out, but also beckoning you to continue that journey, like what's going on further down. If it's a bunch of blank walls, you're less likely to be interested in continuing that journey. An example of this is uh, at Camp Pau, the street that's that really connects or terminates at Pearl at um, the Pantlin Hotel or at Amway. If you're walking down that street, there's like a, a in fact, I think I have a picture of it here. Well, I'll, I'll get to that story. So. Uh, the the first one of these is like a compositional thing so like we're we're striving to have like this three-part building and the point of this is not to mimic this building because you know we probably don't want to do that but there's this this building is a really great example of this three part you know it's got the base it's got this middle part and then it's capped with something in this case it's capped with something that's really sort of of its time and excessive but uh for today's era but we also talk about what that looks like on a more contemporary building. And so the, the, the JW also has the same sort of pattern, right? It's got the base, the middle, and the top. And so thinking about those things and how you compose a building and then thinking about some of the buildings that have, we've built recently that don't necessarily do a very good job of that. They, they sort of complicate it a little bit. So making sure that that's part of the, the language that you're beginning to create in terms of this. And, and all through this document, you're gonna see these orange boxes and the yellow boxes. Orange boxes are telling you why it's important. The yellow boxes in this case are telling it's about style. So we're not mandating a style. It's important to realize that we're, we don't want you to build the 1880s building. Just use that as understanding the concept. Uh, windows, if you're gonna have punched hole windows like these on in this diagram or these photos, you know, try to recess them a little bit so we can get some shadow lines. Oftentimes what we're getting is like this thing that looks like wallpaper where the windows are just like flush with the wall and you know, it's, it doesn't articulate the facade enough. It doesn't give us these like vertical and horizontal patterns which are also important in the building. So like this vertical here these verticals here, these horizontals here are all um, enhanced or accentuated by that window opening and how that window opening is a little bit recessed in the wall. Um, so that's, a, that's another thing where we're talking about the composition of the windows and really getting some relief, some shadow lines, and then uh, using that window pattern to establish another uh, pattern on the wall. 
going into more of a curtain wall situation, which a lot of our buildings are built with, and again, we use the JW as an example of this, it's basically a wall of glass. But if you look closely at it, and, and many successful curtain wall buildings do this, is that they still create that vertical and horizontal pattern. So you're, you're able to uh, uh, establish that, that pattern that's discussed here in a different way, in a more contemporary way. And we're not anti that. We're not opposed to that kind of building. In fact, there's two of them being built right next door to our office right now. They're almost done. Um, the the Facade lighting is another one. So what can we do? Again, these are guidelines, so these are ways to help us understand how we're funding a project. So what are the, some of the things that we can help fund? One of them is to begin to think about how we're lighting these facades at night because our downtown tends to uh, go to sleep at night or die. So it's, it's not very vibrant. Uh, the building up in the upper left actually is downtown, and that's lit oftentimes. There's a few other examples of our downtown, but how do we begin to light these buildings so that they create some dynamic things at night? And so that's something that we can do. We can pay to enhance that in the project. Uh, we can even go further and do projection mapping, which is something that we've explored internally. We haven't gone anywhere with it yet, but it's something that's on our radar in terms of mapping that and putting the, the um, light shows on the buildings. And there's a lot of good a lot of good places downtown where we could do that. Uh, materials. So this is this one talks about the use of materials. I think that when we talk about human scale, one of our desires is to um, have materials that are at that pedestrian human scale. That means that your bricks are sort of like small, like they used to be, versus the jumbo bricks that we use today for some reason. And so we've used those. Uh, like right here, this is 234 Market, these are jumbo bricks. Um, and the reason for that is that, you know, a human being was much more akin to be able to stack that brick, and that's who was doing it. It's not a machine, it's a person. Uh, when you start scaling them bigger, it sort of distorts everything. And it's cool, it doesn't matter when you're driving 45 miles an hour on a car because, you know, you don't notice it. You can you can put drive it up and nobody notices it. But, um, when you're walking, it, it makes a huge difference to have that sort of scale of, of materials interplaying. So that's a big one. Uh, durability is a big one. Um, but I, I think another one is just the number of materials. So this building here on Monroe Center has got like two different materials on it, essentially. This building in Seattle has like, I think, five to seven. Uh, one's shitty and one's not. So, I mean, I think that the overuse of like all of these materials on these buildings is really sort of corrupting those buildings. And so as an entity, if we're, f if we're helping to fund your building through an enhancement grant or um, our development support, we really encourage you to use less materials. Less is more. Um, so I, I think that that's a, that's a huge one that, that we see over and over in our city. Like there's just too many materials being used. and uh, it's not, they're not used well, they're used sort of clunky. So like these are, these are all like sort of clunky. Um, not, I mean, there's a lot of other stuff going on that I won't get into with that. But, um, so that's, that's another one. And then a simple material palette. So, so this building and, and Ted's here. So he, you know, he did this building. I admire this building. It's a, it's a modern building, a fairly modern building. I think 10 years ago, maybe 15, Purple East. It's empty right now, but it's a, it's a really great storefront, and it's a really simple material palette, and it's not fake old. So, I mean, that's a, that's a good example of what we could do, you know? Like, and it's, it's, and it's, it, it's gonna last longer than this building, and it's probably, as, it's probably cheaper to build because there's just simpler stuff going on with it. And it looks nicer too, I think. At least that's my opinion. Um, Here's the blank wall. So this is this is the wall I was talking about. This is what connects our two sort of hotels, JW and and the Pantlin. Uh, this is sort of a death march, you know, like um, Thunderdome or whatever you want to call it. Uh, and it's on sort of both sides. It's articulated in different ways, but uh, this one's the most brutal. It's a the sidewalk's really narrow. It's like five feet. 
Uh, we've tried to dress it up, or Amway has tried to dress it up with um, some some lights on the trees, but it's it's just a, a really shitty pedestrian environment for where it is in our city. So it's unfortunate. And if you will, if you look down that street, it's not really inviting you to go anywhere. You know, it's it's like I want to get off that street as soon as possible. You know, either to the river, which I can't really tell where that is because of the parking decks, but you know, or back over to Rosa Parks. Uh, conversely, if you look at the buildings on division, you know, the, there's a huge difference between those two things. And those are about active walls, it's about the details, it's about the windows, it's about the doors. Uh, we, we've done some buildings downtown that do a lot of this stuff with all the transparency and everything, but you got like a whole block of building frontage with windows and like one door, one door and like 300 feet. So we want to be able to get to a point where we're uh, pushing for doors that are more regular, you know, like there's more doors. We want it to be permeable. We want it to be active. We want to be able to get in and see in and get out and see out from that wall. Uh, and then we go into storefronts quite a bit. Uh, we've done, I've personally done like hundreds of iterations of this thing over the course of, of many years. Uh, so. This one just ex tries to get us to a point where we're doing storefronts well. Again, you don't have to make a storefront that looks like this one, um, but you, it can look like this one. You know, it's, it's, there's a variety of different solutions to this, but they, all good storefronts have certain attributes, and those are outlined here. There's a bulkhead, which, which is really this wall that the glass sits on, and all of these don't have to be there all the time, but they're good to think about. Uh, there's display windows, and the display windows are big, and they got stuff in them that I can look into. They don't have 32 signs on them, and they don't have a bunch of dirty lawn chairs sitting in them. You know, there there's stuff that I that that's interesting to look at when I walk by, and inviting me to come in and selling what I what I might buy. Uh, there's an entrance that's usually recessed. You'll see it here, here, here. Uh, that's nice in our climate because it sort of like protects you when you're coming into the doorway, and you can to set your umbrella down. It also is like a, a way to decompress from the street before you enter the store, the shopping experience, or the restaurant. So it's me a mental, a slight mental decompression as you come in from outside. Uh, there's Then there's the transom, which is not always evident, but it's sometimes evident. And then that just helps to heighten our storefront experience. And then there's a beam, uh, which is also sometimes called a horizontal expression line, and that sits here oftentimes with signage on it. You'll see it here on Monroe Center. You'll see it here, um, not with signage on it. So uh, those are sort of the elements that are critical to our storefront. So when we're evaluating a project that has a storefront, we would sort of be looking at these things and saying, do they have any of them? Do they have none of them? And how does that affect our investment decision? Then we can start to vary the storefront. So once we get really good at storefronts, we can actually start to think about ver uh, putting some variety into them. So these are uh, some that, that are um, mostly in Paris and London, I believe, except for Ted's um, and, and Madcap. And so you can do different things, like how about adding some color to them? All of these ones over here have a variety of color going on with them. So it's starting to in institute some color in our concepts, in our storefronts. That's sort of a good idea. So everything's not like tan and red and yeah. Um, and then this one breaks a lot of rules, but it's still functioning sort of the same way. There's a, there's a, there's a lot of window. Uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a beam here, or there's a, there's a horizontal expression line here. Uh, I think if you did all of your storefronts like this, you might get overwhelmed, but having them punctuate a street could be good. So we talk about these variations on a theme to give people some guidance about what they can do to not just make like the, the 1880s storefront. 